expert in comparative religion, born and raised in the USA. He is currently the president of Masjid al-Islam in New Haven, Connecticut, and is the professor for world religions and African studies at Manhattanville College. Dr. Jimmy Jones, I welcome you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you doing? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. It's good to have you on the show with us. Alhamdulillah. Um, the first question I'd like to ask you is for you to give us a brief background of yourself, you know, your early childhood and how you were raised. Alhamdulillah. I was born in Baltimore, Maryland in April of 1946. I was born into a Christian family. Uh, as we know from the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad, alayhi salatu wa salam, that uh, we're all born Muslims, but our families often raise us something else. So I was raised in the Baptist church in the South because I was born in Baltimore, but I moved to Virginia. And so I was raised in a very religious family, a very religious Christian family. And during that time, I learned a lot about Christianity, particularly in uh, that uh, kind of situation in the black church. As you have told us, you are a convert to Islam. So I'd like you to just give us a brief background and share with us your story of how you were guided, alhamdulillah, to the religion of Islam, the only religion accepted in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So um, during the time that I thought I was a Christian, a foundation for Islam was laid for me in the sense that uh, what's called the black church in the United States of America is a very, very uh, strong church that's focused on love of God, uh, but they call God uh, Jesus, uh, uh, we, and we don't believe this yes. anymore. And, uh, but that was cultivated in the church, and the sense that, uh, that scripture was the ultimate authority, even though we didn't read it as much as Muslims read the Quran. And so uh, as a young uh, boy, I grew up in the church. I sang in the choir, I, uh, I taught Sunday school, I uh, read scripture during the service. I did these things which many young people still do today uh, in Christianity. And so uh, a, a love for religion and a love for uh, God at that time, I was confused about what it really was. Uh, that was cultivated at that particular time. Uh, what began to move me away from that is the whole idea of Trinity and that uh, the idea that God uh, emptied himself out and became man, a'udhu billah. I mean, this is a, a thing that, uh, what we call uh, in academia, cognitive dissonance, and the idea that just didn't seem to fit correctly. It seemed that it was a strange idea because if God emptied himself out and became man, then when Jesus was here, where was God? And all these kinds of things that people would talk about. I, I wasn't aware of these things when I was young because I was so immersed in the culture of the church, immersed in the music, immersed in being, um, uh, I was raised in a family that was very active in the church. We used to go uh, Wednesday nights to prayer meetings. And uh, also I was a part of a, a gospel course that was uh, directed, I was raised by my second cousins, that was directed by my second cousins that used to travel around different places. So I was immersed in the culture of the church, and I liked the music a lot. I liked the music a lot, so uh, I didn't often think about the kinds of things that the music said. But one thing that was particularly stunning in retrospect was uh, one of the songs that we used to sing uh, when Easter came around, and the name of it was The Old Rugged Cross. Maybe some of your viewers who are Christians or were Christians know it, uh, the, the lyrics go something like, on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. Now, this, uh, those who know anything about Christianity know that the cross is a primary uh, symbol of Christianity. And so to, to say that's an emblem of suffering and shame, this is a point of cognitive dissonance there because Easter is supposed to be a happy time. I know that, that, that Christians believe uh, that Jesus Christ was, was crucified and resurrected, but the reality is that the cross is a symbol of death, song with a symbol of suffering and shame. And I used to wonder why would uh, Christianity make you know, this cross that was so negative to be uh, a central focus. And so th there was this cognitive dissonance that started maybe in my teenage years. This is when people get to be more aware of the world and things that are going on ar around about them. And so uh, 
I, 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 I sat with that unease because uh, when you're a teenager, uh, often you go through different phases in life and uh, you rebel against uh, many things that you're taught by people. But since, again, I like uh, the black church in general and I like the music, and I liked the, so, the social atmosphere. I did not leave it at that particular time. It was only when I went to college. I went to college at Hampton Institute, uh, now in Hampton University in Hampton, Virginia, that um, I began to think differently about my religion, even though one of the first things I did was join the chapel board uh, at Hampton Institute because I'd been active in the church when I came from uh, Roanoke, Virginia, where I was raised. So it was now, uh, I went to Hampton in 1964. Uh, I pretty much stayed active in the church up until 1967, when uh, this is during the civil rights movement in the United States yes. of America. And during that time, uh, there was this fellow named Stokely Carmichael at that time. He ultimately changed his name to Kwame Ture, and he moved to Ghana. Uh, but uh, he was going around making the circuit, as it were, speaking at colleges about uh, black power. Uh, this is a, a term that he had made famous on one of the civil rights marches. And I went to uh, Ogden Hall, which is a famous uh, hall where we congregated at that time on campus, to hear this guy speak, knowing that intellectually, you know, black power didn't make any sense to me and that he, I was going to destroy what he said intellectually. Well. The main thing that struck me about that is that he emphasized the things that we're being taught uh, at Hampton Institute as being Eurocentric. Uh, and we were a historically black college and university, that's what we call these days HBCU. He emphasized that, and he emphasized that there were many things that we weren't reading about that had to do with our history as a people. And as I listened to him tick off books that he thought we should read, one of them that he, uh, he mentioned was the autobiography of Malcolm X. And I was uh, a bibliophile, and I still am, I love books. Uh, I went uh, and read that book during the summertime, and I was immediately impacted by two things. One, uh, Malcolm X's critique of race relations in the United States of America, and two, the religion of Islam. And so these two, the, my reading of these, uh, this autobiography changed my attitude toward race relations in the United States and also changed my attitude toward religion. And before this um, reading of Malcolm X's biography, had you heard much about Islam? Had anyone approached you about the religion of Islam or were you a total stranger? No, no one had ever approached me about the religion of Islam. I was uh, raised in the, the South. I'd never, I, I, the, the world was very insulated at that particular time. Uh, the South I was raised in was segregated and insulated in the sense that you didn't hear much about anything going on outside of the South or even outside of the United States. Uh, I didn't even know what an Arab was. Uh, there was, an, uh, there was an, we called them, uh, there was a store that was a half a block from where I lived, and uh, the people who ran it were Arabs, but we called them Arabs at that particular time. And the likelihood is that they were Christian, uh, uh, but uh, it, it was called Asset Store, but it was probably, it was probably a Sayyid was probably the name, but uh, it, it became, you know, anglicized when they came to the United States of America. And so no one, you know, uh, I think this was an uh, Arab uh, Christian family, so they didn't introduce them to Islam. I think the first encounter that I had with the word Islam was when I used to belong to uh, the... Harrison Elementary School Boys Choir. Uh, and we used to travel uh, around Virginia and up to the Washington, D.C. area. And when I got to Washington, D.C. during my travels, sometime in the late 50s, early 60s, uh, I saw members of the Nation of Islam. I did, just didn't know who they were. And they uh, wore bow ties, the men wore bow, yes. bow ties. Uh, they wore dark suits. And the women had on their version of the hijab, where it was, was back behind uh, their ears. Their ears would be out, and their neck would be out. But, and they were all dressed alike. That's the thing that impacted me most. I never thought anything of it. I just thought they were some strange people. So, uh, and somebody may have mentioned that they were the Nation of Islam. 
But again, being comfortable in the, the church in which, to which I was going, I, I didn't think much of it. It's time for a break now. Join us after the break, and we'll hear more about Jimmy Jones' story coming to Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Spread the word of Islam. Let me remind you that the glorious Quran is not a book of signs. S-C-I-E-N-C-E -E, but it is a book of signs. S-I-G-N-S. -S. It's a book of ayats. How much time do you spend reading your Quran every day? How much time do you spend in Salah? If you want to be the best, you carry out the work of Dawah. You become the best. Allah does not count the number of times you repent. Allah looks at the quality of your Tawbah and not the quantity of your Tawbah. If you are able to seek knowledge and you choose not to, you carry the full sin. Islam came to establish a civil society. This material world is nothing but a test. This Quran is a miracle of miracles. It's a miracle of all times. Islam in Focus, every Friday to Wednesday at 11.30 p.m. Saudi Arabia and 12.30 a.m. UAE on Peace TV. He faces... He listens... My question is about the beard about Imam Mahdi. What are the people believing? He answers... So number one is the help of Allah. He satisfies in the light of glorious Quran and authentic Hadith. If Allah helps you, believe me, you have to get success. Catch Dr. Zakir. Then we have the next call, please. To get convincing and valid answers in Dial Dr. Zakir every Sunday at 7 p.m. Saudi Arabia and 8 p.m. UAE on Peace TV. Explore the options. Match the qualities. Assure the success. What happens at school, or more specifically, what happens inside the classroom? The classroom. The classroom. Good qualities of classrooms. Interactive, challenging, collaborative, distributive focus, student-centered. Let's together examine the quality of education that is provided to our children. To judge this quality precisely, join me on Peace TV. Join Dr. Mandu Muhammad in Teaching at School, next on Peace TV. Spread the word of Islam. Welcome back, brothers and sisters. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Before the break, we were discussing with Dr. Jimmy Jones here of his conversion story of how he came to Islam. And we were at the point where he had picked up the biography of Malcolm X. So can you take it from there, Sheikh? Yeah, uh, reading the autobiography of Malcolm X opened my mind up to two things, as I said before. Number one, uh, a, a different analysis of race relations in the United States and number two, a different vision of religion. Uh, up until that point, on the issue of race relations, I was fairly conservative. In other words, I, there was a, a, a guy named Whitney Young who was affiliated with an organization in the United States called the Urban League, uh, and he wrote a book called To Be Equal. I love books. And it, basically, it was a gradualist approach to integration and uh, de dealing with the issue of segregation in the United States of America. And so uh, Whitney Young was more on the conservative side. Uh, Stokely Carmichael, whom I mentioned before, and Malcolm X were more on the radical side, that we want freedom right now. Uh, what do you want freedom? What do you want it right now? This is the idea that we got. And so the notion of the urgency of getting justice for uh, black people or African-American people was something that was new to me that I took up from reading the autobiography of Malcolm X. The other issue, and both issues were justice related. The other issue was a vision of religion. Uh, I began to wonder, the other thing I, just, I began to wonder about is why there was no real direct critique, at least in my church. There was no direct critique 
of this injustice in America, not in my church. Now, you had the civil rights movement, in all fairness, Martin Luther King came out of the black church, and what he did was a critique uh, over and against uh, racism and segregation in the United States. But it wasn't the kind of critique that I would necessarily yeah. hear on a Sunday uh, in the service or in Sunday school. And I, so in reading the autobiography of Malcolm X, I was wondering why nobody ever talked to me about the injustice of racism. I always assumed that it was just natural for white people to be in charge because that was the way uh, I had grown up. So what I saw in the autobiography of Malcolm X was a kind of cognitive dissonance in two ways. Number one, in terms of race relations, uh, I became more radicalized, as it were. Uh, before Malcolm X, I was more conservative about race relations and doing something about the situation. And uh, the second way was my vision of religion. And uh, learning about race relations and the difficulties there, and looking at my religion, Christianity at that time, I wondered why nobody in the church, nobody in the leadership that I knew about ever talked about race relations in the church because after all, uh, your religion has to do with your values and about justice and the like. And I was quite upset when I read the autobiography of Malcolm X and saw the parallels between his life and mine and began to understand that people had really had misinformed me, had misled me, and I was very upset about it. So. It, it, it was out of reading the autobiography of Malcolm X that started me to reading about Islam and more about black nationalism, but Islam in particular. And I read almost everything I could get about Islam, making no differentiation between books by Muslim and books by Orientalists, for instance. But uh, it, it takes me a while to change it, it. That started in 1967, 68, and it was another 10 years uh, before I actually uh, took Shahada. Uh, and reverted to Islam. Uh, I even uh, took my family at that time uh, around to several churches in New Haven, Connecticut, where I was living in 1979, to give Christianity one more chance. I was given one last chance. And I went to several churches, and I liked the music, I liked the people, I liked the vibe, as they said. But when the preachers started preaching about Trinity, I just... <laughs> couldn't, just, just didn't make any sense. Uh, and unfortunately, many of the churches that I went to did the kind of preaching off the cuff, as it were. That is, that there was no relationship between what the preacher was saying and what was in the Bible. They sort of were inspired and made it up. And, the, and so the combination of the Trinity and the notion that they didn't seem to have any standards for the kinds of things that they said in their, uh, in their, uh, in their sermons, uh, that sort of made me break with uh, Christianity. Alhamdulillah, you have told us how, how you have your lead up to Islam, but can you describe to us the moment you actually took the Shahada? Oh uh, yeah, it was, uh, I joined the then community of Imam Warfuddin Muhammad, uh, and uh, this is after Elijah Muhammad died in 1975. I never joined the Nation of Islam because uh, that would have been another form of cognitive dissonance for me because I never accepted the racially based paradigm, the racially based model that they had. And so uh, I basically uh, was a fellow traveler of the Nation of Islam because for a long time in the city of New Haven, the only people giving dawah was the Nation of Islam. There were Muslims there, I found out after the fact, but the only people who were calling people to quote Islam was the Nation of Islam. And I admired their discipline. I admired uh, their economic development program. I liked their bean pies. I liked the, the fish sandwiches that they sold. Mm -mm, they were delicious. But this idea that white people were created by an evil scientist and that white people were evil, I just didn't buy it. Having come being raised in a segregated society, I didn't feel that I needed to turn it on its head. And be, I just came from a society where black people were less than simply because we were black. Now they were arguing simply because people were white, they were a devil race. And this is something I never accepted. And so, uh, so, so I, it was even several years after Warf D. Muhammad took over, because he took over in 1975 when his father died. It was four years after that. It was in the community of uh, Imam uh, Dr. Abdul uh, uh, Hassan uh, that I took Shahada in October of 1979. 
And it was a liberating experience. I mean, because uh, again, it was very, very difficult for me to leave the black church, leave the music, and leave uh, eating that meat, you know, eating that pork and all that. It was, it was difficult. And, but when I, when I finally made that step, it was very much liberated. I felt that I'd found my home. And this is the natural way for people to be, to be in submission to God and to God's law. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. And how was your family's reaction? How did your family and your friends react? Because obviously in your society, there were hardly any Muslims. You had never even come across Islam. So when you broke it to your family, it was a very mixed reaction. Uh, uh, some people were very happy because I was nicer to them as a Muslim than I was as a Christian. Because uh, in reading Quran and, and looking at a Hadith, I found that my family had rights over me, whether they were Muslim or not, and particularly my mother. You know, we know the Hadith about this. And so I was much, I was much more family-oriented as a Muslim than I was before and people liked that very much. There were certain people in my family, an aunt being one of them, who was very conservative in their Christianity and very focused on the church as a way to salvation. And she was very, very upset about the fact that I took the Shahada. But my wife and I, who she'd all, she had taken Shahada before me, my wife, that was my first wife, I'm, uh, I'm married to a different wife now, but we took Shahada about the same time she took it before me. We were visiting this aunt uh, one, during Ramadan. Uh, we were fasting during Ramadan. And uh, she was very upset because we wouldn't eat, you know, at her house. And what is this new religion you have? First of all, you wouldn't eat pork. Now you won't eat at all. And, <laughs> and she was a little frustrated by that, by that. And then she said, and then my wife happened to have on sandals at that particular time. Oh, did they tell you to wear these shoes too? You know, it was that kind of thing. But I said to my aunt, her name was uh, Aunt Ethel. I said, Aunt Ethel, do you believe in God and the last day? She said, yes. Do you believe that, uh, that on the last day we will be judged by God for what we do on this earth? She said, yes. I said, then why are you hassling me? I believe in God and the last day. I believe that on the day of judgment that we're going to be judged by what we do on this earth. Why don't you harass the members in the family who don't believe in this at all? Because I'm, I, I'm, I'm better towards you than I was as when I thought I was a Christian. I visit you more when I thought I was a Christian. And I said, please, you know, I, I, I believe in God in the last day. We see this thing differently, but please, I, I, I want to respect you. I'm in your house. I want to keep good relationships with you because you're my family, you're my blood, you're my, you're my father's sister. But please, uh, let's not uh, give each other a hard time. Maybe you might want to spend some of the energy on people who don't go to church, who don't believe in God yeah. and the like. Ever since that day, she never harassed us about Islam. And lastly, before we end this episode, you were very active as a Christian. You used to go to church on Wednesdays, on Sundays, you used to be in a choir. So what motivated you when you came to Islam to start giving dawah and inviting people to the religion of Islam? Actually, what motivated me is that I was told by the leadership at that time, because I had a college degree, that I ought to teach Islam. A little non sequitur there, because I didn't uh, know a heck of a lot about Islam, that, so that was on-the-job training. And so therefore, I, I, they, I was sent into the prisons to teach there, which, which was a little bit chaotic in 1979 and 1980. And uh, uh, that's what started because, uh, you know, I could talk and uh, I could read and, and present in an orderly fashion Islam. And so I was basically ordered to do so by the leadership of the, of the, of the then, we called it uh, temples at, at that time. Dr. Jimmy Jones, I thank you for sharing this information with us. Um, I hope we have learned a lot. We've come to an end for this episode. So I hope to see you next time where we'll be discussing more about the life of Jimmy Jones, memorable moments throughout his life, and also problems we face growing up in the West. Hope to see you next time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Spread the word, oh man. Spread the word of Islam. Oh, fortunate one. Paradise must be won. Paradise must be won Each day and each night 
Through darkness and through light Cry it out to the world Spread the word Spread the word Spread the word